You're listening to Design Between the Lines, the only design and home furnishings podcast where we talk with the movers and shakers, industry innovators, and lifetime legends of the home furnishings industry. It's here that I get a chance to sit and chat with the influencers shaping the industry into what it is today. This episode of Design Between the Lines is brought to you by Strictly Santi, award-winning designer David Santiago's trademark brand, known for a clear, distinct vision that transcends from residential to hospitality design. David's unique and custom upholstered furniture, lighting, and wall coverings have his signature touch of color and graphic element. His collections are made to order and available through StrictlySanti.com, American Brass and Crystal, and Bijou Wall Coverings. Embrace the unexpected and get ready to be santified. Today we welcome Ulrich Tumbelt, a textile industry veteran whose expertise spans multiple countries. His career has demonstrated both executive management prowess and a fervent passion for all things fabrics. While native to Germany, Uli currently resides in North Carolina, where he is the CEO of the Sattler Corp. Uli, welcome to Design Between the Lines. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, I'm going to start right off by saying... Take yourself back in your mind to the days when you were, as we all someday were, much younger. And you were, uh, think about what brought you to, what attracted you to this industry or got you here. Uh, and, and even within that, what got you into the textile side of the industry? That's a, that's a very good question. I probably can talk half an hour about well. this, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to, to make it very, very short, maybe, uh, my father uh, was in the textile industry mm-hmm. for a very long time, for decades, and he was the uh, director of many spinning operations within a, a group in Germany, textile uh, group in Germany, spinning and weaving, finishing mail. So I grew up with it. So you, um, I, I had to earn a little bit of money if I wanted to have, you know, wishes yes. as, as a teenager. <laughs> so I had to work on the weekends in the mill. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it was very easy to work, of course, in that mill. A, it was five minutes from my house. Second, my dad worked there. Mm-hmm. And the third was uh, I was able to drive a car before I turned 18 on the company grounds. That just got me right into the mill. There you <laughs> so, go. Yeah. So I grew up in the textile industry and um, uh, I worked there for many weekends and many weeks during the school vacation. But I didn't start studying textile engineering until uh, until later. So I actually wanted to go into mechanical engineering. And I studied uh, mechanical engineering while I did an apprenticeship mm-hmm. in mechanical tooling. So after this two years of mechanical tooling, I so much missed textiles. So I changed universities and studied um, uh, textile engineering. That's how I got in it, and I've been in it ever since. Fabulous. Well, along the way, from maybe through your education or into your early years, in the business, uh, did you have any mentors, any people that you you have good feelings about as being ones who supported your career or you in a career Mm. along the way? In the beginning, it was my father. Mm -hmm. So once he realized I'm going to step into his shoes, he uh, did everything possible for me to see the world, the textile world, not just in Germany, but mostly in Europe. Uh, So he was uh, very straightforward in, in his expectations, uh, which isn't so hard when you think you know it or everything as a teenager, but he, <laughs> he was my mentor. And I had a mentor at uh, Zellweger Oster back then it was called. So this is a company who makes uh, textile laboratory equipment. Mm-hmm. And their head of their um, R&D department uh, was more than a veteran. He was really a textile genius, mm-hmm. um, not just in textiles, but also in statistics and math, and I always liked statistics, I always liked numbers. So he mentored me um, not only during during my studying time, but also afterwards until um, a little bit after he retired. Uh, and in between, of course, we do use coaches. Mm-hmm. In, uh, also at Suckler, um, we have the possibility uh, to have a coach, personal coach, to uh, guide you through some difficult questions you come upon us. 
mostly management, obviously, but uh, in the textile world. Textile, textile is a funny world because it's very big, but it's also very small. Mm. So if you have questions and within the organizations, people will do everything possible to answer them to their ability. So there's really a, it's, it's almost, it's a collaborative effort. I mean, it is. people yeah. are there to help each other. Correct. Grow. That's yeah. uh, that's mm. remarkable. That's good. But it's such a highly technical field. I would imagine that's needed uh, most of the time, people sharing information. And it is. Knowledge. Yeah. Uh, tell me about what you, how you feel the, what the significance of fabrics and home furnishings industry is as a whole. I mean, how how much weight does do textiles carry in in the overall scheme of things in furniture and home furnishings? In your opinion, yeah, I think textiles uh, create emotions mm-hmm. uh, first by design, mm-hmm. by color. So. That's where it gets very difficult because every individual has feel different about different colors, different patterns, different yeah. tones. You know, it's just people driving different cars. It's because every car is designed different, has a different color. It's the same for home furnishing. Mm. So, uh, but it creates an emotion in the, right from the beginning. And to hit this emotion, that's a tricky part of the design, not just the fabric, but also the furnishing, mm. but which in turn also makes it extremely important and and uh, very interesting for the consumer, but also for the manufacturer. You know, a little earlier in the conversation, you mentioned that your dad wanted to make sure that you had some education in the European sphere of, of mm. the textile industry. Um, you've done a lot more traveling since then, of course, in your career. Um, how have your travels shaped your career and contributed to your breadth of experience? How, how do you feel that traveling has helped you? I think it really widened my horizon a lot. Uh, I was very fortunate early on after I studied to uh, travel with uh, Trichler, uh, which is a German textile machine mm-hmm. manufacturer through over 30 countries uh, in the world for many years. And while that was not easy being on your own, <laughs> uh, that was an experience by itself. Yeah. Uh, it showed me also the different textile mills, mentalities, you know, problem solving solutions. Uh, it changed my world and in a way because the region I'm from, from Northwest of Germany is, um, uh, was in the past a very heavy textile industry. Mm-hmm. It almost all died away. Uh, there's still some significant industry there uh, in terms of textile. Um, but being there versus uh, all around the world with so many different cultures was in the beginning uh, quite a shock for me. I had I had to adjust to this first. Uh, but over time, when you start opening yourself up, it was truly amazing for me. And I still think back about those times and think, how would have that director reacted in this situation? Or what what would he or she would have done. So mm. it helped me quite uh, quite a bit to see beyond the table or beyond the problem we are in right now and look for outside of the box. So that, well that put. really helped me a lot with that. Well put. Mm. Well, as a native European, what is it like for you being based in the USA now? And have you been here long enough that it's really an everyday thing now or... Yeah, it's an everyday thing. Not not saying I don't miss my my heritage. <laughs> I do I do like to go back to Germany, but when I'm in Germany, I also like to come back. So yep. uh, I I'm here 16 years uh, now. So um, my wife is from California. My kids grew up here, uh, and one is in college studying mechanical engineering. Funny enough, Whoa. yes. Uh, but I I love it here. And oh. especially the Carolinas is truly my home. And if I think back after I traveled so many years around the world, my first place where I actually lived for two and a half years was Charlotte. I'll be darned. Yeah. So when I came back to Charlotte in 2016, it felt like home to me. Uh, it was really like, oh, yeah, this is, my, this is my second home after I studied, you know, which was decades ago, obviously. <laughs> but, uh, that's how. Yeah, oh, I, I'll never admit it was decades ago. You're good. You're good <laughs> with me. You. Well, so, so, uh, you know, I'm thinking about the European background. I'm thinking about traveling back and forth that you mm-hmm. do. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you do to stay ahead of the curve in business? Now, I know you're going to see things in Europe. Mm-hmm. Sands the period of time we call COVID. Let's just right. throw that out and Before just say there. any mm-hmm. other year. Mm-hmm. You're back and forth, and you see things there that haven't 
hit here yet. I mm-hmm. mean, do you, do you have, um, is that part of what helps you stay ahead of the curve? You're seeing things as they're just coming out of the market or you're staying, you're t- staying one step ahead. I mean, yeah. how do you stay ahead? This yeah, we, we, uh, that's a beauty of our company uh, right now. Uh, as long as you communicate well and you use that knowledge um, and you dive in it and take it with us. And Sattler is a great group in this. It's extremely well managed. Uh, it's very open in communication. Uh, no one hides really any any knowledge. The, the good part of that is um, the European design, especially for awnings, Mm-hmm. Uh, fabrics, but also uh, partly in casual furniture, um, it's usually two, three years ahead in terms of color, not necessarily in patterns, mm-hmm. but in color. And that helps us. It helps us bring in these designs over early on. And um, we don't want to swim with a trend. We want to create a trend. Okay. And there was always the, the goal is always within Sattler and the Sattler group to create trends. We work with them very rapidly design trends, um, even psychiatrists in, in Europe to help us uh, what is going to be really in in three years, not just in Europe, but also in Asia or also in, in America. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, we sit together and decide what are we going to do with those and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when do we launch those? Uh, so because launching date is very important, you can't be way too ahead and yeah. no one is going to buy it. Um, at least not in the numbers we like it yeah. to see, but uh, it, it helps us a lot. So I, we take a lot of that with us, and the intercompany exchange is quite uh, livid. I mean, we travel a lot back and forth, not just me, but between the designers, the product development, the sales. Yeah. You know, it's great so, if I can travel, but that doesn't help. It yeah, needs to so be in everybody. Way, yeah. yeah, so in a way, this communication and the traveling and the yeah. being together in different places. That Correct. sort of is how you're finding harmony in the creativity with the creativity and the business goals that you have because mm-hmm. you're bringing the people that are have both together in the same room, I guess. Yes, we do. To, and, yes. and I guess you do this frequently uh, to keep ahead of the trends or, as you said earlier, make the trend. Make the trends. That's yes. exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, so what is a day in the life, in your life like? What is that? When you get up in the morning, I mean, you've got – You've got probably you're communicating with people in different time zones. Yeah. So what's a day in the life of Uli like? Oy, uh, that's <laughs> a good one. <laughs> it, it doesn't start all that early as you may think because I'm not a morning person. <laughs> okay. But I do, uh, I do leave the house around 7 and I drive an hour and 15 minutes to work hmm. one way. So I, in the morning, I use the time to either listen to some podcasts. Uh, mm-hmm. I talk to Austria a lot on the phone, mm-hmm. uh, which um, is, is a good thing because by the time I hit the company, I'm I'm all in. Ah. I'm good to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in the evening when I drive back, I use the time to call the salespeople on the West Coast because it's afternoon there. So that helps in, in this perspective. So travel time is usually pretty active phone time for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and during the day, it's typically a very structured day. So we uh, we have our days typically structured out with meetings, mm-hmm. not too many of them, but some distinct meetings. And uh, we take our time for lunch, uh, refresh, get mm-hmm. the brain a little salad, uh, settled, and then uh, we start from there. Good deal. Good deal. Mm-hmm. Mittagessen, I believe that. Mittagessen, That's yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's an important thing in the German culture, as you oh, know, all yes. European, all yeah. European cultures per se. Oh, yeah. So, and I've been here 16 years, 17 years, but I, without Mittagessen, I'm probably not such a happy camper. So <laughs> it's better if I have one. <laughs> Uli, what, what equates with excellence in design in the, in the textile world to you and your way of thinking? Usability. Usability. Yeah. And comfort. This is for me, unlike a sculpture or a picture, which you can sit in front of it for hours and study it. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, textiles have to be not only aesthetically beautiful, but they also have to be uh, usable and long lasting. So uh, I like to identify myself with what I buy. And if you buy a sofa, uh, if you buy a piece of furniture, um, you mostly buy it because of a purpose mm-hmm. and it has to fulfill this purpose either because you 
put something in it, mm-hmm. you know, put a TV on it, or you sit in it. Yeah. Well, you mentioned long lasting. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about uh, what the word performance means to you in textiles. Yeah, performance is a way, it's a big word. Mm. Uh, so when it comes to our world mm-hmm. uh, at Sattler, uh, performance is, is uh, what we're known for. So Sattler is uh, in, in uh, Europe not only the leader in design, but also the leader in the performance attributes uh, of the awning. And we're here at Sattler Corp with our outdoor brands, the casual furniture mm-hmm. fabric. We are uh, very well known for the performance attribute of uh, longevity. Okay. So uh, not uh, not disintegrating very quickly in the environment is extremely important when you buy an outside furniture set for a few thousand dollars. Well, uh, speaking so, of that, so you've got a color in this fabric, let's say, a yes. color or a pattern or something. So what is it that, that makes that color last a long time? How, what do you do to to lengthen the longevity of the color? Yeah, we use solution dyed acrylic uh, fibers. Mm-hmm. So what that means is in the so in the solution, the spinning solution of the yarn, the mm-hmm. pigments mm-hmm. and high quality pigments uh, are uh, embedded uh, when you spin the yarn. So uh, unlike a dyed fabric uh, where you hit the outside of the yarn with the dyes, but never into the core, with the solution dyed, you hit, hit the color all the way into the uh, into the core of the uh, of the yarn before it even is spun. before it's even uh, in woven? the spinning pro- before it's spun okay. and then of course when it's after it's spun we weave it mm-hmm. and of course it stays very well in there it doesn't wrap off uh, what's also very important is this part um, solution dyed acrylic is is one part but the other part is what kind of quality pigments you use because there's a lot of solution dyed polyesters acrylics polypropylenes out there. Uh, but the pigments, the quality of the pigments is, is very, very important. Mm-hmm. And we always are in very deep discussion with our suppliers uh, about the quality of the of the yarn. And mm-hmm. we test it. We have all, all means of tes- uh, testing uh, those yarns and those fabrics uh, on their longevity. I'm thinking about... Mm-hmm. What we have in our backyard right now, we're on our patio. We've got a we've got a, a an umbrella, mm-hmm. uh, outdoor umbrella that uh, that has a kind of a chocolate brown color, which has lasted a good long time. Yeah, surprised me. Mm-hmm. But you know, here we are in North Carolina. And mm-hmm. Tomorrow it will be ninety four degrees. Uh, it's going to be hot. It's going to be moist. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the sun is just going to be beating down. I'm I'm guessing sun. Mm-hmm. And it's degradation of things is mm-hmm. one thing you're looking at, right? Yep. And then I'm guessing weather mm-hmm. is is another. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a, those are all things you you guys regularly test for, correct? We do, on on all ends, yeah. And of course, moisture is a, is um, a contributor to many problems, mm-hmm. uh, indoors and outdoors. Uh, but uh, with our uh, yarn and our finishing uh, capabilities and qualities, we we keep this pretty much in check. So. Do you test within in-house and also outside, having independent testing as well done? Uh, we do both, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I wondered whether that was probably mm-hmm. just standard for you all. Uh, we test every day, but not uh, not every day outdoors. So oh. uh, it's either upon a, a, com- a customer's request that we test outdoors or an institution likes to see independent uh, numbers. But we also make sure that our testing equipment is always calibrated mm-hmm. and right. So we we have to do uh, outside testing to make sure that our numbers really correlate to the real world and of course to other testing equipment. Only a couple of quick things I wanted to review. One thing, it, it came to mind reading a lot about uh, Dura and Sattler and it, it, obviously there's the patio mm-hmm. uh, uh, awnings and furnitures and things with fabrics on them. Tell me a little bit more about the marine side of, of outdoor textiles and uh, performance fabrics. And mm-hmm. Is there a difference between what you have to look at in terms of colors and patterns and mm-hmm. certainly durability for mm-hmm. marine mm-hmm. use? I, I think marine is like the testing ground of any textile. 
<laughs> so because not you not only have the uh, sun and and um, the the rain, uh, you have a lot of ballast partly on it, uh, mm-hmm. but you also have the uh, at least on the coastline mm-hmm. uh, the salt, oh. the salt spray. Yes. So that really puts the uh, the fabric and everything around it uh, to a to a test. And if you see if you want to see how a fabric performs, put it on a boat. Uh, oh. And you will see it very quickly. So uh, we uh, we are um, we're very comfortable in that field because we know how long our fabric lasts uh, versus the versus um, the other uh, companies in in this field. Uh, friendly competition, but uh, we also uh, know this very well, of course, from the harsh conditions in Northern Europe, mm-hmm. uh, where you have uh, vast temperature differences as well. And the marine application is a very special one because uh, your bimini or your dodger, mm-hmm. uh, it should look uh, nice and taut, not only at, at 95 degrees Fahrenheit, but also at 35. And it should look like this after you uh, uh, puddled a lot of water on top of it for a long extended of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and afterwards, it has, it has to have memory. It has to come back because okay. nothing is worse than a bimini over your head, which is sagging through, yeah. not only aesthetically, but also you have water puddling it. And I don't think you want that water running over your guest when you start driving. No. So uh, that is very, very important. And um, we're, we're very comfortable in this field. We have friends uh, that have a, a, a tritune boat on the lake up yeah. in, uh, in Virginia. And uh, his, his biggest problem right now is in their boathouse. Yeah. They have a thing where we're going to try. He and I are going to try to engineer this away. But okay. uh, they have a, a certain birds who like to uh, relieve themselves, let's yes. say, yeah. on top of this cover that he's got over mm-hmm. the boat. Mm-hmm. Now he's trying to figure out how to. So you're going to have to make sure that it's cleanable from that material. <laughs> yes, you, you, uh, that is right. Sometimes time is also of essence. So. <laughs> yeah, that's true, with seagulls <laughs> you know, and other but, birds. Uh, you, can, you can take it off. I mean, our fabric is also bleach cleanable. Now don't take 100% bleach, sure. but uh, obviously follow the guidelines the dilution, of yeah. very diluted bleach. But you can, typically you can take it out. But uh, bird droppings is probably the worst you, which you can get. And if you get up to Maine and you have mm. a lot of blueberry fields, Oh my. Uh, it gets very interesting so the on white canvas. The sooner is always better, uh, even for regular upholstery, uh, any in, for any stain. Just even just like with your shirts, uh, mm. don't put it in a in a bag and wait a week before you get to the dry cleaner. <laughs> Time is of essence in anything, and uh, it is the same also with bird dropping. But our materials are coated for the marine part, so it usually washes off pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, just don't let it bake in for a couple of months uh, okay. because then it will be more difficult. I'll try not to. Yeah. I know we did that <laughs> so, when we were teenagers. We don't. We try not to do that now. It, yes, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, so let me ask you: You take your drive into work, but you drive to a very unique place. I hear. I, I understand that this this building that you you you're company is located in has mm-hmm. some historical uh, significance. Can you tell me a little bit about that? It is, and that is so exciting about it when you walk through. Uh, so the building is uh, uh, up since 1904, and it used to be a cotton spinning mill for many decades. Uh, so the Schufford family eventually uh, bought this building. They're very close. They still have their short tape plant where nearby and Century Furniture. So Schufford family, of course, is down in Hickory. I think Alex so, Schufford is going to be in your seat in a couple of weeks. Uh, well, s- sell him, say hello to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, they bought it um, a few decades ago mm. and uh, formed and founded the, the brand name Outdoor, Matter in fact, uh, before we bought it uh, from them in uh, 10 years ago. Actually, mm. we had just had the anniversary. Well, congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're very proud. So we have done a lot of investments in this building. Uh, not only in, in terms of machinery, uh, but also inside and out. So, and we are. This is a continuous prog- project. Obviously, we opened up some of the old, old windows, the historic windows, which were bricked up, uh, and we're tr- uh, bringing more natural light into the building. And when you walk through it, you still see a lot of uh, uh, wooden floors. Oh wow! Uh, which is quite amazing. Um, and when you when you come from the office into the warehouse or into the manufacturing area, uh, I sometimes smell the cotton. 
So, so because I grew up in it, so I, for me, it was you know it was it normal. Is. My nose is still somehow calibrated, and you <laughs> still smell this this textile and the building yeah. is. Uh, it's very nice. It's very nice. So, so let me ask you: In your opinion, um, changing the subject just slightly, yeah. Um, how is the textile design business shifting to accommodate to today's consumer? You're doing a lot of research, obviously, on mm -hmm. the technical side. Mm -hmm. So who do you reach out to? Who do you talk to in regularity? And I know you've had some recent experience that's been written about in, in the news media mm -hmm. about getting input from uh, interior designers of some repute mm -hmm. uh, and their their uh, thoughts about mm -hmm. where where outdoor uh, uh, textiles mm -hmm. are going, where they should be going. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how much of that is important to you, and, and how is that reflecting on uh, on your ap appealing to today's consumer? Uh, yeah, so the trend in the industry is really the inside is moving outside, okay. or the outside is moving to the inside, and you uh, you probably have heard that yes. a lot. <laughs> yes. So I'm not the only one who who is saying that. I'm sure <laughs> or using this terminology, but it hits it right on the mark. Uh, so. Uh, I just have to look in, in my community I live in and see how many patios, uh, enclosed or not enclosed, have been built over the last uh, five years. Not just during COVID, of course, everything was yeah. accelerated uh, because of the stay-at-home orders. Uh, but even before, you saw the trend that the ar architectural design of the of the furniture and even of the patios become somewhat similar to your living room, mm -hmm. uh, and this is not just limited to furniture. This is also limited. This is also decorative uh, pieces. Mm -hmm. This could be your fire a fireplace, oh, open or closed. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of things move there, and uh, when you start decorating your patio like an inside, obviously your couch will, uh, or love seat or whatever you buy will be very similar. And we watch this trend very carefully on on many levels. Uh, and obviously, we, we uh, our designers uh, are looking at this very close, but we get a lot of input from our salespeople as well. And so, so what you're saying to me, it sounds like really that that you know they're taking consumers are taking the experience that they've enjoyed and had and the the pleasures of of, of the experience they've created with their interior design, right? Outside mm -hmm. and creating another experience there. Is that that's absolutely right. And isn't that great? It's wonderful. Uh, it's fantastic. I, I I think it was long overdue. Um, the, the, of course, in, you made it happen because of the fabrics that you're, are available. If we've had the old fabrics, yes, you would have never made it. Right? Yeah, our our advantage at Sattler is probably we we sell so much in Europe. We don't have so many out side days. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you see a lot of pergolas and enclosures outside, literally a second living room with a lot of natural light because it rains so often, especially in the northern Europe part. Um, it is not that uh, not that warm in the in the winter time. So uh, we we thrive uh, in a way uh, from this because we know exactly what it feels like to design something like this since many, many years. And um, having this here in the Southeast is quite a phenomenon because it's pretty hot in the summertime. Oh yeah. But uh, people <laughs> want to spend more outside in the wintertime as well when it's when it's only 45, 50 degrees. They want, still want to be in well, the Well, they have their outside. little fire pit, right? They yeah. yeah. Well, so let me ask you, you, you've been a leader in this industry a, a long time, yeah. uh, well-respected leader. Um, what is your advice to others in leadership positions who who aspire or who aspire to be, mm. that may be listening? Uh, what, what, in your opinion, makes a good leader these days? I think number one is listen, listen to uh, to uh, within the organization, obviously uh, between your your peers and um, enjoy enjoy what they have to say, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, obviously also uh, outside in the industry. So uh, I think the hardest part last year was you couldn't really communicate face to face, either with your colleagues or with uh, with other leaders mm -hmm. in the industry, where you learn a lot from as well, mm -hmm. um, as well as your customers. And uh, that was a little hard last year because we didn't have that. But uh, I always liked uh, like to listen and take in a lot of opinions, and then start 
puzzling puzzling this together in a way. And I think this is very important that you do that. Well, all right, now let's take it one step further. Let's say you're talking to students out there who are thinking yes. about careers mm -hmm. in, in, in young professionals who maybe mm -hmm. haven't made their mind up what direction they're taking. Right. They've got a they've got a, an engineering degree, they've got a, a design degree of some sort, mm -hmm. or they're heading that way. What's your advice to students today, uh, uh, certainly coming out of COVID and going into uh, some sort of career? What, what would you give them as, as advice? What I mostly enjoy with students is their, their look onto new things, their creativity. And I think my, uh, my biggest advice would, them, uh, would be that um, don't forget about those. Uh, don't, it will be, it's sometimes not very easy for students to get into a corporation. Their processes, mm -hmm. their responsibilities, there's a daily stress, there's mm -hmm. email and all this. And oh, yeah. very often things get forgotten. And uh, what happens most, what I've seen at least, is that the creativity of, of our young students just gets eaten up by the processes. Uh. And um, that that hinders a lot of development and a lot of opportunities. And my advice is to, to stay young, stay young and keep, keep that going. Don't forget where you're coming from and what you wanted to do. And if it doesn't develop uh, whatsoever, have a conversation with your superior or, or with the CEO of the company. Uh, don't, uh, of course you have to respect um, the, the hierarchies. Yeah, the hierarchy. Uh, of the, yeah, mm -hmm. that is very important. Uh, until your earlier question about the CEO, yeah. uh, you know, don't let hierarchy be in the way of anyone in the company to talk to you and uh, share uh, your ideas, your problems, uh, your problem solvings. And this is the same for the students as well. They should always have an open ear, even at the top management for what they are thinking. Uh, I think this is very important and they should not be stopped by the hierarchy by this. So never think that your your ideas, your thoughts are, are not wanted. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's much nicer put than what well, I said. No, no, you did, <laughs> so. you did beautifully. I was just trying to wrap it with a nice bow there. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, think, I think we've come to, this has been fabulous today. I really mm. enjoyed having time to, to pick your brain a little bit, learn mm -hmm. a little bit about who Uli is. And uh, and I've heard a lot about you before you got here. So uh, all good, okay. all good. <laughs> and uh, I thank you for being with us today yeah. on Design Between the Lines. Oh, thank you so much. It was really a pleasure. Best of luck to you, Uli. Thank you. Design Between the Lines is produced by Element Studio with the International Society of Furniture Designers. We record in High Point, North Carolina. To find videos of these podcasts, be sure to subscribe to the International Society of Furniture Designers YouTube channel. To learn more about ISFD, visit isfd.org. And don't forget to subscribe to hear more industry stories of design between the lines.